Okay, so welcome everybody to the One World Mathematical Game Theory Seminar. We're proud to have here today Kalyan Chatterjee from Penn State University. His areas of research are very varied, learning, bilateral trade, bargaining, coalitional formation, all of these and more. And today he will tell us about learning with limited memory, Bayesian versus heuristics. The state is yours. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, some point maybe it would be nice to actually visit but <laughs> that has to wait until all this um, gets over which I hope is soon. So this is co-authored with uh, Tai Wei Hu of the University of Bristol who's also here and uh, uh, what we wanted to do was to sort of examine uh, uh, the use of Bayesian inference, which uh, is sort of the a way, I mean, what we were taught, uh, um, at least when I, when I was a grad student, my main advisors were Howard Rafer and uh, John Pratt. And uh, they wouldn't countenance any deviation from any Bayesian orthodoxy. In fact, John, who is a very nice person uh, ordinarily, uh, wrote a really nasty review of somebody uh, who had criticized uh, Bayesian analysis. But uh, anyway, so it's the foundation. But uh, one of the things which I heard when I was a student was a talk by Amos uh, Tversky, um, who described how people actually didn't, I, I think his paper with Kahneman had already got published, but the one in science, but uh, that's the talk he gave basically. And he said that um, uh, people did not use Bayesian analysis in real life, and uh, but they weren't uh, mistakes as such. They seem to be systematic biases. Well, it depends on what you mean by the word mistakes, but it could be mistakes suggest something random. And he said, these are not random. They're actually uh, systematic deviations from Bayesian analysis. And uh, so uh, that's, on the other hand, he, uh, uh, well, he didn't say it in the talk, but he sort of implied that he still felt that um, from a prescriptive point of view, Bayesian analysis was the right way to go. Um, but other people have uh, sort of even disputed that part because, uh, I mean, for example, there's a, uh, Court case, uh, I guess I can get, in which a psychologist explained to the jury, this was in England, the psychologist explained uh, Bayes' theorem to the jury, and the judge basically said that the jury was forbidden from using it because uh, it would unnecessarily, what he said was that. Um, he said, well, he said exactly what's said here, but what he really meant was that uh, qualitative analysis could take into account things which were uh, more complex and at least the Bayes, uh, Bayesian analysis that had been suggested uh, sort of ignored that kind of complexity. So he actually, uh, banned the use of Bayes' theorem in that particular court case. So what we are trying to do here is uh, maybe I'll get rid of uh, too many things there. Okay, so uh, uh, the last quote here, um, at least for now, is from Simon in the 1956 paper, which introduced the word satisficing. And what he suggested was that uh, 
we should explicitly consider uh, rational decision making subject to constraints. Um, this may not have been what he meant by satisfying because he used that term later on again. And uh, but in particular, the limitations and the capacity and complexity of the organism. And um, then uh, under what circumstances that would give something akin to Bayesian analysis and whether one could uh, uh, list the environments that uh, lead to that could lead to further simplification of the choice mechanisms used by people. So basically, we interpreted this to mean two things. Uh, look for simple environments where Bayesian learning can be implemented by finite capacity decision makers. And uh, in this case, Bayesianism is appropriate both for descriptive and normative uses because even with uh, some capacity constraints, uh, these environments are uh, simple in quotes enough that uh, Bayesian uh, analysis works. And in cases where the environments are too complex, where the best uh, method of inference Bayesian analysis is not available, we could look for constrained optimal rules, which are necessarily different from Bayesian learning. But on the other hand, um, are the best one can do in the circumstances. So these are the two things that we wanted to uh, look at. And uh, once we get what the optimal um, rule is in these complex environment, uh, we could examine to see how it deviates in a systematic way from uh, Bayesian, unconstrained Bayesian analysis. So these are the two main things that we wanted to do. And we also wanted to talk about the role of randomized trans transitions. Um, so uh, is randomization useful and in what cases is it useful? So that's uh, a sort of side theme running through what we do. And um, so we model these constraints by using finite automata. And there's a paper by Opria and AER, which provides some experimental justification for uh, this kind of use. And we look at a particular uh, problem, sequential sampling, which um, uh, is in a book, at least that's the first time I saw it. It's a book called Sequential Analysis by Wald, which was published in 1947. Um, so we are going to use finite automata and uh, I should say quickly that uh, maybe there's a literature slide somewhere else, so I'll wait for that. Um, maybe I can, maybe I can skip. Well, let me talk about the literature slide and when we get to it, I can skip it basically. So, uh, so finite automata in uh, inference is not, not new, in fact, Electrical engineers and statisticians have been doing it since the 1950s and 60s. And um, uh, the most relevant to our uh, purposes is a paper by Hellman and Cover, which was published in the Annals of Statistics, Annals of Mathematical Statistics, I think in 1971. So they use limit of the means um, and an infinite uh, horizon mo uh, model in which uh, the decision maker, there's one decision maker had to take an action every period, which was sort of like state matching as hypothesis testing. Now, um, 
in this setting, uh, well, and the other uh, sort of uh, important paper in this was written by Andrea Wilson, uh, which actually used uh, discounting, uh, a similar problem, except she had um, a, an exogenous probability that you'd be called on to make the decision at any given point of time. And uh, so most of her results are also for the discount factor or continuation probability very close to one. So to that extent, um, in fact, the automata she characterizes are quite close to the ones in Hellman and Cover. Um, even though she has very many different results and we uh, sort of take off from where she left off. But um, the, the problem with both of these is that there's no hope really of answering the first question because uh, the problems are essentially infinite. The more you learn, the better off you are. I mean, if there's a cost, then there's, uh, you stop at some point, but otherwise you keep going. And cost was not considered in either uh, Hellman and Cover or um, Andrea Wilson. So um, in Wald, on the other hand, there is a possibility that we can replicate the optimal uh, method of inference by some uh, automaton, finite automaton. It won't happen all the time, but it's possible. So uh, just a quick quick uh, recapitulation of Wald, which is probably unnecessary here. Um, but uh, we have been surprised by how many people actually uh, immediately think of Max Min when they think the Wald. And in any case, anyway, so the two states of nature and two actions, uh, these actions are sort of state matching that... Uh, if you're called on to act, then you uh, try to find the action that most matches the your perception of the state of nature. And uh, you get a sequence of sampling signals and have to decide whether to continue sampling or to make a terminal decision. The only payoff that you get, positive payoff, is from the terminal decision. It's costly to acquire signals. And um, um, so essentially you uh, acquire a finite number of signals eventually. And uh, so Bayes' rule is used to update the posterior. And um, so uh, in, in this case, because the problem is essentially a finite one. You only get the payoff if you um, take the terminal action. So you don't want to keep postponing that for uh, a long period of time. Um, there is a hope that we can resolve uh, the first problem. However, we do show that even this problem can get really complicated to the extent that it's not possible to uh, use Bayes' theorem to resolve it. We'll come to that later on. And uh, so <clears throat> our decision maker is uh, one player, but uh, in common with what's been done in the automata literature by various people, um, we use this notion of multi-self consistency, which I'll talk about later on. Um, and I can't see the rest of the slide, so maybe I should, yeah. Um, so the finite automata are used optimally. Uh, at least we try to do that. Uh, it's not always an easy task to find uh, what the optimal automaton is, but uh, we particularly focus on when it implies randomization, for example. 
And uh, we resolve or we study, in addition to studying the walled problem, uh, we study two simple environment. One is a model of breakthroughs used recently in the paper by Che and Mirendorf, for example, in which one signal is very informative. And uh, in this case, we can actually characterize the optimal automaton. Sometimes it's possible to get the full Bayesian analysis. And sometimes um, uh, we have to resort to randomization. The second uh, environment we look at is where the log likelihood ratios of signals are rational proportions of one another. And then we can also characterize the optimal solution. However, uh, if they're not rational proportions, then the generic environment is complex and the unconstrained Bayesian rule cannot be implemented by finite automata. And this is due to two different reasons. One is the limits of information storage. Um, for example, the cost of collecting information becomes really small. And the second is that the probabilities themselves might be complicated numbers. So every time you update, you get something that can't be handled uh, posterior that's too complicated to be handled by um, finite automata. So uh, in terms of qualitative findings, randomization sort of implies information stickiness in the sense that you get a signal and you don't move from where you are, so you don't actually update uh, with some probability. Um, and we show that whenever the memory capacity is binding, the st strict randomization does turn out to be optimal. And um, the other is rule stickiness, which is used for the second environment, essentially. If you are close to rational numbers, even though you can't replicate Bayesian inference exactly, you can use the same simple rule to optimize the automaton. And this rule is quite simple. In fact, it recalls a, a letter that Benjamin Franklin wrote to Joseph Priestley in 17, whatever it was, 70 something two, um, in which he sort of suggested uh, making a decisional balance sheet with pros and cons and then canceling them out. But we'll get to that later on. These constrained optimal rules yep. that we find, sorry, are there, is there a question? Yes. Can I ask some orientation uh, question? You speak uh, all the way about finite automata and sometimes you speak about randomization. So there are various concepts of automata that have been used. So can you just clarify, you, you could use time. So there are automata which have in addition a clock. There are automata which are pure automata. There are automata which have uh, tra probabilistic transitions, probabilistic actions. So what is when you call here finite automata, what do you refer? Yes, I'll get to that in a moment. We are not allowing time, clock time. So that's okay. one restriction I can tell you about immediately. So, and, But you allow randomization of the transition. We allow randomization of the transition. And uh, there's a paper by Kalai and Solan, I think, which sort of um, shows that if you allow that, then you don't need to randomize on the decision itself. So we don't sure. have random decisions where the choice is made. Okay. Okay, let me. So here's the uh, literature slide, which is very sparse, um, mainly because there isn't time to go through everything. But 
Elman and Cover essentially have uh, lots of papers on this. Um, um, though Hellman is not working on this anymore, I understand. And for randomization and limited memory, again, there are several papers, but we are using the multi self consistency notion of Piccione and Rubinstein, uh, which they used in um, uh, the absent minded driver. Um, example, which was, I think, in 1997, may have been earlier. I think Rubinstein might have had a paper in mathematical social sciences earlier. But anyway, that, um, so like, uh, that's what Wilson also uses, except we are doing it in a different problem. And Kalai and Solan, I think we've already, I mean, uh, just mentioned. So no randomization with respect to decision. So let me say something. Um, so for the talk, I'm going to restrict myself to two signals, which are realized at each period IID, and two states of nature, um, capital H and capital L, where the prior is denoted by pi zero. Uh, the paper has some discussion of multiple signals, uh, especially in the second part, uh, where we look at these uh, rule stickiness results. And, um, but it turns out the two states well, I don't know if we can do with more than two states of nature. This is something we tried very hard to do, but our, as far as I remember, Wald only did two states of nature. And uh, other people later like Chernoff, uh, who did the continuum, um, at least in the paper of Chernoff that I've read, he had only asymptotic results, so I don't know. Uh, whether one can go further than two states of nature. But multiple signals, of course, one can uh, presumably take into account. But we restricted ourselves for most of the time to just two signals, except, as I said, towards the end. So conditional distributions uh, are denoted in this way, where the uh, state of nature is the superscript and the signal generated is the subscript and just one second uh, let me turn off my phone i keep getting calls from some organ of the democratic party every five minutes but uh, even though the election is over, I thought, but anyway. Um, so these conditional distributions are such that uh, the small h signal is more probable under a high state and the small l signal is more probable under a low state. And most of the time, as you probably expect, we are going to restrict ourselves to look at the log likelihood ratios, um, which have a simple form. I mean, the posterior has a simple form. And this is the simple form. Um, so you start with the likelihood ratio of the prior, then add up the log likelihood ratios and you get the likelihood ratio of the posterior. And the signals, as I said, small h drives the posterior higher and the low signal drives the posterior lower. Now, uh, the decision maker can take one of three actions any period. One is a terminal action that ends the game, that's AH or AL. Uh, 
And if uh, she takes that action at time period T, uh, her utility, the utility she gains is U of A theta. Um, and it's discounted by T minus one. So uh, in this case, the cost of information acquisition is given by the delta. If delta is small, then you don't want to keep acquiring lots of information because the payoff that you get is uh, postponed by a long period. And uh, that way we avoid having to take into account a separate cost, which could become very high. Um, so the state of nature is not observed by the decision maker, otherwise there'd be no problem. And whenever the terminal action is taken, the game is over, but there's also a non-terminal action, which is to collect more information. And that is uh, denoted by W, which is to wait. And um, then basically, um, the first time you reach a terminal uh, node, um, I mean, you reach a terminal state, actually, uh, you take that terminal action. Before that, you're waiting. And that's sort of given by this. Uh, the expected payoff, as I said, um, only matters um, uh, at the time of the, um, well, I'm sorry, the payoff you get is only after you take a terminal action. <clears throat> and it could be uh, something like this. There's this P0 of theta, uh, which is the prior you start with. Um, I mean, remember that we are ultimately doing likelihood ratios, but I'll come to this in a moment. And then this is the set of signals that you get. Um, then this is the time T at which you decide to make a terminal decision. And this is the terminal action that you take. You take A theta. And for any time period before that, you take wait. And this gives you an expected payoff. Um, and the theorem, which is that two thresholds and um, so if you go above this threshold, then you take terminal action AH. This is the uh, log likelihood ratio of the posterior. And if you go below this threshold, you take action AL. And in between, you wait. So for example, it could be that in three steps, you cross the threshold for uh, taking the high action and you take action A. So this is the walled analysis. Okay, now finally, let me define what an automaton is. Uh, a determinant, so we'll find actually that uh, to go back to that, that some of the analysis that we do is quite similar, at least in form to what Wald did. So this is one of the things that one notices about both Hellman and Carver and their predecessors in statistics and um, electrical engineering and Andrea Wilson that the optimal decisions don't seem to have very much to do. The optimal automaton, the decisions made by them, made by uh, the optimal automaton doesn't seem to have very much to do with the original problem. I mean, it's not their fault. That's the nature of the problem. Uh, so the, determ uh, the deterministic finite state automaton, which we call DFSA, consists of a finite state of updating states. So these are states in which you choose weight, uh, Q, plus two action states, which we label QH for taking action H and QL for taking action L. A transition function, 
tau, um, which takes your state um, and the signal you receive either to another updating state or to one of the terminal actions. And there's an initial state Q0. The process ends when an action state is reached and the action is taken. And um, the internal states of the automaton follow a Markov chain essentially. So that if you take a partial history up to T minus one and add the signal XT, then you get the transition occurring after x1 to xt. That's as usual with. Um, so a decision rule can be implemented with M, which is a particular finite state automaton. If for all sequences x, lambda M of x is in an updating state, if the decision is to wait, and is equal to Q theta if the decision is to act. And so for example, here's an example of a finite state automaton uh, where Q1 and Q2 are the um, updating states. You start at Q1 and you get two H's and you take uh, QH uh, then you go to state QH and take action AH. And if you start at Q1 and uh, see signal L, then you go to QL and take action AL. And um, now if you start at Q2, then you have something similar. You only need one. H to get to QH. So the two models where um, the two um, specializations, the two specifications where we can, in fact, get Bayesian learning implementable, implementable by a DFSA, which is a deterministic finite state automaton. There's a model of breakthroughs and one of simple cancellation rules, which is the Benjamin Franklin one. And um, I should emphasize that this is for sufficiently large automata, still finite, but we'll talk about what happens when the automata are small. So the first model Uh, in this case, L, the low signal reveals that the state of nature is L. And you, then you take action L, AL. Uh, inferences occur only if you get the H signal. Um, so in this case, deterministic finite state automata uh, can implement Bayesian learning. Um, and we'll get to I2 later on, but because these are rational numbers, essentially we can use the same cancellation idea that uh, Franklin and maybe many others after him, but I guess um, using Franklin suggests that we know a lot about history or something. <laughs> Uh, so then H cancels out L according to appropriate weights. But um, these are essentially the only simple environments, though um, we haven't proved a necessary condition. It's just that we, I think this is what somebody described as proof by lack of counterexample. But um, we, uh, these are the only simple environments in which we could actually replicate Bayesian analysis. Okay, um, 
and uh, there should be a picture somewhere. Okay, maybe it comes later. So, um, so if you have general signals, which is not um, uh, not the model of breakthroughs, then there are two sort of impossibility results which are proof. For delta sufficiently high, the unconstrained optimal rule cannot be implemented by a deterministic finite state automaton with the number of updating states bounded above by some k. And uh, this is actually fairly clear because delta sufficiently high means the information cost, acquisition cost is low. So you would want to make um, as many, uh, you want to choose or see as many signals as you can before making a terminal decision. The second one is a bit more complicated. Um, um, this is one of the many places in which Taiwei's expertise in computation theory came into play. But um, generically, if you don't have the rational numbers and if you don't have breakthroughs, then the unconstrained optimal rule cannot be implemented by a deterministic finite state automaton. And the reason for this is a bit more um, subtle, I guess, which is that um, the limits of computational power. Um, is there a question? Um, so if RH over RL, I mean the absolute values of that, uh, if that's not a rational number, then you need detailed computation of posteriors. Uh, and this quickly gets you into an unbounded number of states because remember that a finite state automaton essentially can handle only a finite set of posteriors um, without rent, well, um, each state corresponds to some posterior probability, which we'll talk about later on. Okay. Um, so here we fix uh, an upper bound on the number of um, updating states and look at constrained optimal rules. You'll first do that in simple environment. Uh, I'm sorry that we got the wrong date for the second citation of Kalai and Solan. Um, I think it should be 2003. Uh, well, Solan is here, right? So he can maybe correct us. I have no idea. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine this was decades ago. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it's 2003. Anyway. Um, um, when the memory constraint is binding with the actions being deterministic, randomization may be optimal. And um, so uh, in this case, though a deterministic finite state automaton is not optimal and we can't replicate Bayesian analysis exactly, um, a stochastic automaton can do quite well and then um, the transition from getting some signals X to another state can be probabilistic. So tau could be a probability between zero and one. That's the probability of going from Q to Q prime. And um, we'll talk about this result more later on if there's time, probably there won't be. Maybe I'll hurry up a bit. But I think of this mainly as a, as a way in which you can um, get over the problems with going to a terminal state with very few updating states. By randomizing, you sort of 
wait with some probability and get more signals so that when you finally exit the updating states and go to the uh, action states, you're in a much better inference position to do that. So, so one of the things which uh, was shown in her problem by Andrea Wilson, which I, as I said, is, a, is different from this, and actually follows from Piccioni and Rubinstein's uh, games and economic behavior paper uh, is that with randomization, the optimal rule is sequentially rational in the sense optimization implies that you're indifferent between the states between which you're randomizing. You essentially randomize just between two states uh, and you're indifferent between those two states. And this follows from a notion they call multi-self consistency. Uh, so this is sort of the only appearance of game theory in this, uh, I guess in this, in that each self uh, mans uh, or each self controls a state and all states are reached with positive probability. Uh, otherwise you get rid of them. If there's some state which is not reached with positive probability, you don't need it. Um, so, uh, and this player will only randomize, this player decides on the transitions or this agent or self decides on the transitions and will only randomize if he or she is indifferent between staying on in the same state or going to another state. And uh, sequential rationality implies some kind of beliefs and um, we can actually calculate the beliefs, though so they're a bit odd. Uh, anyway, I'll, uh, um, I won't talk too much about this because it's um, take a long time, but uh, so the beliefs have this uh, feature that you calculate the, um, probability of reaching Q or the likelihood ratio of reaching Q uh, conditional on the states of nature. And if you get a signal X, then that likelihood ratio changes by the log likelihood ratio changes by adding R of X. So uh, what is this P Q of theta? It turns out not to be a, pr a probability because uh, what Piccioni and Rubinstein do and what we do as well is we look at different paths that take us to this particular state Q starting at some prior Q0, some prior state uh, or initial state Q0, which I guess I should have mentioned in describing the automaton that there is an initial state. So the Q0, from Q0, it could take you one period to get to Q, in which case the payoff that you get from being at Q, which is a derivative of the ultimate payoff you get by reaching a, an action state, that's discounted by one delta. If it takes two periods, it's discounted by two and so on. And so you notice that these beliefs involve delta, which is... Um, they're not really probabilities at all, but it turns out that they have a, um, have an interpretation of the total probability of reaching a particular state. One could interpret the deltas as continuation probabilities, in which case this might be a little more um, credible, but uh, that's what these numbers are. <clears throat> and so I already mentioned this. And um, once you get to an action state, this part I didn't mention, the action A theta maximizes expected payoff under the belief Q theta. <coughs> Pi of Q theta, sorry. Um, and VQ of theta is a continuation value. Um, 
given the, the likelihood ratios. And um, these continuation values can be calculated by looking at when um, the process reaches an action state and sort of working backwards. Um, so this is the result and one can actually formulate the optimal stochastic finite state automaton under Q being less than K. Um, so it's optimal, then it's multi-self consistent. Um, and for any Q, uh, this is true. It's greater than zero only if R of QX is in this interval between R bar I and minus one and R bar I. And these R bars depend on the payoffs of V of theta. Uh, so it's an interval and if it goes to um, one of the boundary points, then randomization is possible. If it goes to the interior, then the probability is one. So there's some positive interval of uh, likelihood ratios. And in order to randomize, you have to hit the boundary. And uh, this is a similar structure to the unconstrained optimal rule. Transit to the action state only if the belief is above RK bar or below R0 bar. But these beliefs are not given by Bayes' rule. They're given by this expression that we looked at before. And that has uh, potentially some information stickiness because you don't move from uh... Okay, so here's the um, optimal rule. So this, um, un under the breakthrough model where a signal small l reveals l. And of course, if you get signal l, then you move immediately to the terminal state where you take a a l. And so um, essentially the only thing that remains is how many h's it takes to cross the threshold which depends on delta, uh, r pi bar. And if it takes four, if you start from pi zero here, it only takes one L signal to go to Q of L. And if it takes four H signals to cross the threshold to get to Q of H, then essentially you can do um, you can replicate the optimal decision by looking at um, a deterministic finite state automaton uh, with what four updating states and two terminal states or so three three updating and two term four updating states and two terminal states okay but if you have k less than four then um, this automaton is not implementable because the memory is too low and in this case, stochastic transitions are in fact optimal. And we have um, this result. I thought there was a stronger result here. Anyway, I've written it down here. So K is greater than or equal to three. The unconstrained optimum um, uh, I'm sorry, if, de if this delta is small enough, the unconstrained optimum is implementable. But if delta is large, then you have the optimal automaton has randomization in every updating state. And what's interesting is, is that you have the same probability of staying in the original state and one minus alpha is the probability of moving to the next highest state. Um, so the states are ordered by the likelihood ratios corresponding to the state. Um, so in this case, the symmetry of the problem gives us that alpha 
essentially is the same for all states. Uh, so as far as we know, this is the sort of first clear cut result on the optimality of randomization. Uh, one advantage is that there aren't too many papers on this. So maybe it's difficult to, uh, maybe it is the first result. Uh, I remember a long time ago meeting a guy named Steve Alpern at LSE. And he told me that I can't imagine how economists work because they have to read hundreds of papers. In mathematics, we only have to read a few. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he was correct or not, but anyway, here's one area of economics in which maybe a few is enough. Of course, it's possible that we missed out papers, so I'm not. Okay, so um, we can also show that if we uh, allow approximations like Hellman and Cover do, or uh, I don't know if Andrea Wilson does in her paper, but um, for any prior, um, if uh, even if um, these results, uh, if mu of H given capital H is not exactly one, if it's sufficiently high, then we can get uh, um, uh, an automaton with one updating state, which gets with randomization, which gets very close to the unconstrained optimum. So randomization can be very powerful. Now we got asked the question in one previous time we've given the talk where somebody said that, well, randomization uh, itself should eat up some states in the automaton. And um, so that's true but we haven't taken that into account. So we are allowing for some exogenous randomizing device which exists independently of the automaton. I'm just saying this to make everything um, sort of clear. And of course, um, Uh, you could have a larger stochastic automaton, which does better. But what's interesting is that the small SFSA does better than large, many large DFSAs. Okay, so that's the end of the discussion of um, the breakthroughs model. And I have about five minutes, I think, right? Um, So let me quickly go through the second one. And so the easiest case is where RH plus RL is equal to zero. So a high signal cancels out the low signal. In that case, the posterior only depends on the net difference between high and low signals. And um, so again, depending on delta, um, we can get a dis deterministic automaton which looks like this, where um, you can go in either direction and the states essentially um, measure the net movement right or left from the prior. And that's enough with the rational. I mean, it, for this, you could go to multiple signals and you have something very similar. And uh, so this is a DFSA that gives the optimal um, result if you have sufficiently many states. Now, one interesting thing here is that randomization is uh, optimal at some points, but it's from a lot, um, a lot of values of this mu, some deterministic automaton is optimal. And uh, so here's an example. Okay, now I, I should say the theorem, but suppose that um, 
uh, we don't have the particular result on uh, completely symmetric mu's. Now, uh, it could turn out that we have, um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it could turn out that we have uh, something that's close and we find that for, uh, we can find uh, values if mu is in between these uh, values, mu lower bar and mu upper bar, then uh, you use the same automaton. It's not unconstrained optimal anymore, but it is constrained optimal. And um, so the same uh, finite automaton is optimal. Now, it says SFSA, but it's, I mean, we've looked at DFSA for SFSA. Um, well, this looks like this. So even though the uh, these uh, likelihood ratios don't cancel out, they're sufficiently close to canceling out so that you can use the same rule and it's still optimal. So this is an example of rule stickiness that you use the same rule in different environments which are close enough to each other. Um, now, if you only have one updating state here, it could be that you have to use randomization as well. Uh, but the randomization is sort of interesting. So this is, um, this gives the area in which you use randomization it's uh, in this region. So um, tau is equal to zero or one. And between this ratio 1.6 to about 1.9 or whatever, tau could be something in between. And here you randomize essentially between two cancellation um, ratios. Um, so using the optimum for one or the other. So the lesson we get from this is that it's very clear when randomization occurs in the breakthroughs model where the bound on memory is somewhat attenuated by using randomization. For this approximation model, it's not clear uh, when you would use randomization, except if you have uh, a small enough automaton, then randomization would be, has to be used because that's the only way of getting out of bounds, uh, getting out of upper bounds on capacity. So uh, is this the conclusion? No, this is not. Anyway, so uh, these optimal heuristics or optimal automata that we use, use approximate or qualitative probabilities in the second um, environment. And so here's the conclusion, um, which basically reproduces what we did. And just to make things less boring, here's another quote from Simon. Uh, the first quote was from a paper which was not published in an economics journal. This is from the AER. So uh, here he says, this is, um, this is Herbert Simon, by the way, I mean, there are other Simons. But in actual fact, the perceived world, the perceived world is fantastically different from the real world. And the difference involves both omissions and distortions, et cetera, and so on. Um, so the decision makers model of the world is only a minute fraction of all the relevant characteristics of the real environment. But it turns out that despite it being a minute fraction, fraction, one can still do a fair amount by using the fraction that we are given in a particular model. Uh, one has to choose a model carefully. So that's it. Uh, unless Taiwei, you have anything to add? I guess we are out of time, but you can add it in the discussion part.
Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I have one question. Um, so in your model, um, you can play the action high, action low, or you can wait to, to learn more, right? Yes. Um, so if I, maybe conceptually, it's not very interesting in your case, I don't know, but it reminds me of these stopping problems when you have to decide when to stop, right? Yes. Uh, and in, the mod, in various models, what I've seen is that once you decide to stop, stopping doesn't occur with probability one only with some probability. So I can decide to, to play action high and for whatever reason it's not happening, but actually I'm just in fact waiting one more stage. And then I, is it very trivial to extend the analysis to the case when, when doing- basically, basically you could generate it by your probabilistic transition. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you look at the highest updating state and you randomize between staying there and going to one of the terminal states. Yeah. Uh, it, it is an optimal stopping problem. I guess Wald must have been one of the earliest people to talk about optimal stopping. Any other question? Okay. Then we thank you. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. Thank you very much for inviting me again. And I hope it wasn't too boring. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I uh, stopped the recording. So if anybody. <laughs>